Thank you, Pat, and, and, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, yeah, what we'd like to do is, is to talk about some new efforts that the agency would like to embark on to uh, promote a stronger and more stable biomedical research workforce. I don't think anybody in the room would disagree with these two statements. Uh, first, that the agency is entrusted to maximize the impact of the research dollars that we expend. And that secondly, we're committed to develop and sustain the most qualified biomedical research workforce possible. But many people in the extramural community have made a series of observations, and here's one of them that summarizes, I think, a, a great deal of work that has been thought about, and that is the Albert's perspective with his colleagues listed here, which says the long-held but erroneous assumption of the never-ending rapid growth in biomedical science has created an unsustainable hyper-competitive system that is discouraging even the most outstanding students from entering our profession. This displays what hypercompetition is all about. The upper tracing represents the number of applicants that NIH has had from 2003 through 2015. And no one would be surprised to see that this just keeps going up and up. What might be of surprise to some of you, however, is that if you plot the number of awardees over that same time frame, it's basically a flat line. And the difference between these two curves, that delta represents the hypercompetition. More and more people really competing for what turns out to be the same number of awardees. So when you look at the age of investigators that are funded by NIH, and we've broken them up into three cohorts, you see some rather disturbing trends. So let's start with my cohort. And I have been a member of this cohort for quite some time. And I am proud to point out to you that my cohort of those over 60 or way over 60, depending upon how you want to, are doing fantastically well. We're doing great. And as you can see, since about 2000, it's just the sky is the limit, up and up and up and up. Of course, the challenge is that we have a finite system. And so this has to be coming at the expense of something else. All of you are aware in this middle plot of the plight of the early stage investigator, those who are 45 years old or less. And so through the mid-2000s, they were in a precipitous decline. And as a result, NIH instituted the so-called early stage investigator policy. And what that did is it stabilized the situation, and this began to level off and remains more or less level today but it's certainly not going up. The other disturbing trend is the so-called mid-career, those 46 through 60. What you see here is that you reach the plateau around the time that we stabilized early career investigators, but now the evidence is that this cohort is beginning to lose ground. And again, all of this is, at, is, is because of this phenomenon. Now, this is not just baby boomer demographics. It's true that the baby boomers will eventually wear out. And those of you who are in this cohort just had a broad smile. <laughs> yes, we will get out of the way eventually, I promise, okay? But it's, it's not just due to those demographics, because there have been multiple analyses which have indicated that this group is just out-competing the other groups. But, but let me amplify what I mean by out-competing. 
this is not about the study section score where they're out competing. This is about the reality that if you have somebody from this cohort and somebody from this cohort, or this cohort for that matter, and both just miss getting their competitive renewal, folks who are most senior tend to have other resources to draw upon. They've been in the system. They may have other grants. They may have an endowed chair. They may have faculty you know, resources. They may have departmental resources. They somehow are more likely to hang on until such time as they can put in that reapplication. In contrast, these folks don't have those resources to fall back on. And they tend to drop out of the system. And that's what we mean by outcompeting. The other piece of data that you need to be aware of is that we have a highly skewed distribution of resources. 1% of scientists receive 11% of the dollars. 10% of the scientists receive 40% of the dollars. Now, admittedly, this is skewed in part by the large clinical trials, which you know, cost a great deal of money. But even taking that into account, this concentration of resources in a relatively small percentage of our scientists has consequence. And so for openers, that concentration challenges our ability to maintain a future biomedical research workforce. Because if we concentrate all the resources, and we know that the most successful cohort are the most senior experienced persons, how then are we to support the mid and early stage investigator groups? But that said, it is appropriate to ask the next question, which is, do the skewed distribution of resources yield optimal productivity? Because after all, what the agency's goal has to be is to get the very best science. Now, if we had the luxury of waiting 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or more years to really understand the value of every grant that we support, because you all know it takes as long as a decade or two decades or sometimes three or four decades before you really know what the value of something is. If we had the luxury of doing that, it would make our jobs much easier. But we're in real time. We have to make real time adjustments so as not to lose a generation of investigators. And so because we don't have the luxury of waiting to get the definitive answer of the value of the work that we are supporting, we turn to surrogate markers. And of course, bibliometrics are the most commonly used surrogate marker. I'm sure that you are all familiar with these first four, because they have been used for many years. And they all have advantages and disadvantages. There is a new marker, the relative citation ratio, RCR, which is described in this publication. This is NIH scientists who have developed this. And I would certainly encourage you to read this paper. What is valuable about this and different than all the other commonly used measures is RCR provides you article level data, and it is field independent. That means you're comparing work relative to the field that it is written in. You're not comparing um, you know, uh, community-based research with basic immunology, which you know, just wouldn't make much sense. The other thing that's very important about the RCR, and this is all detailed in this publication, is that we have validated the RCR metric by using the gold standard of publication value. That is, we've asked groups of scientists, and it turned out to be three independent groups of scientists, to look at large numbers of publications, they didn't even know what RCR was. We asked them to score the papers in various ways. And then we simply looked at whether or not there was a relationship between the merit that was assigned 
by the scientific panels versus the RCR ratio. And in all three experiments that were conducted, the correlation is very, very strong. So again, I would urge you to you know, look, at, look at the publication if you're interested in the details. So when you look at the weighted RCR versus a, 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 a grant count, you, you see some interesting things. Now, for, first of all, what you observe is initially something that should be of no surprise. When you give somebody their first grant, their output increases dramatically. That, that, that's, of course, you know, not, not a bold spot. When you give somebody their second grant, their output continues to go up. Again, nothing that should surprise anyone. But what happens when you get beyond sort of three R01 equivalents is you begin to see this leveling off, something that economists have called diminishing returns. There's a law of diminishing returns. And when we showed this to economists, they sort of chuckled and said, oh yeah, you've rediscovered what we've known for 50 years. And for those of you who are closest to the screen, you'll see these gray shaded area. Those are the error bars. These data are very tight, um, but, but the error bars are actually there. Now, what this suggests is, is that the people who have three or more R01 equivalents are productive. So we're not saying that extremely well-funded individuals are not being productive. Of course they are. But what we're saying is, is that what you get out of that third or fourth or fifth award is not the same as what you get out of the first or second award. This can be um, visualized um, more easily if you, if you do a mathematical transformation. So think about it in terms of input and output. If I give you 10% more resources, do I get out 10% more output? And if I did that, you would have a, a, you'd have a straight line, and the slope would be 1.0. And if I gave you 10% and I got back 20%, then the slope would be positive. It would be greater than 1. And conversely, if I give you 10% and I only get back 5%, then the slope would be less than 1, and, and, and so forth. So if you take the first derivative of this natural log, natural log plot, meaning that you find a tangent along all of these all across all this line, you get the following curve. And so again, if, if what you put in is what you get out, that the slope would be 1.0. And here we are, this is 1.0. And so what this is telling you is, is that with the first award, you're getting a tremendous positive slope. When you get that second award, you're even apparently getting a little bit of a bump up. But as you proceed to three or more awards, you begin to, to cross this point of proportional marginal returns, that slope of 1.0. And indeed, the further out you go, the closer to, to a slope of zero you, you get. So what this is saying is, is that sure, these folks are productive, but, but you're not getting as much out as you put in relative to the effect that you're seeing here. Basically, it comes down to the following. If, if, if you were Dr. Grady, are you going to award a new investigator their first award or their second award or are you going to award an investigator their fourth or fifth award? Now, again, we don't mean to imply that we're going to substitute mediocre science you know, for the great science that's being done. All of you, you sit on this council, you know 
that scores have been compressed because of the hypercompetition, we're leaving a lot of really outstanding stuff unfunded. We used to fund one in three applications. We now fund, you know, roughly, of course, the agency one in five. It, it, we, there's a lot of stuff that we're not able to support. So this is not about, well, you're going to fund sub, sub, substandard science. You're, you're just going to fund additional great science, but not necessarily from those that already have quite a bit of resources. Now, we've been, we've been criticized by many saying that, well, this aggregate data that you showed us is just a fancy grant count. What about the absolute value of the RCR? And so we've redone this plot, median RCR across all publications. Again, this is all based on 70, almost 72,000 investigators. And again, you see exactly the same thing Again, the error bars in gray for those of you who are close. We've also been criticized for doing a natural log, natural log plot. The reason we do that is because the data are not normal, normally distributed. And that should make sense to you in the sense that many people publish papers that are never cited or only cited once. A few people publish papers that are cited many, many, many times. It's just not normally distributed. And so mathematically, and goodness knows I'm not the mathematician, but mathematically it makes sense to transform. But nevertheless, we were, we've been challenged. Show us without any transformation these data. Well, here they are. So it actually looks worse <laughs> when you do it that way. Now, of course, the error bars are greater. Okay, now, around this table, I know that each and every one of you are here. I freely accept that. That's why you're on the council. But concede for me the following mathematical truth. If all of you, everybody seated around this table, is up here, there are more people out there down here. Because if they weren't, we wouldn't get this average line. Members of the community have discussed this diminishing marginal returns from Mongian and colleagues. The main determinant of scientific production is not so much the money invested, but rather the number of researchers at work. And that by funding a greater number of researchers, we increase the overall research productivity Funding the work of as many researchers as possible increases the likelihood that some of them make major discoveries. Orten and Curie. Impact was generally a decelerating function of funding. Impact per dollar was therefore lower for large grant holders. The impact of researchers who received increases in funding did not predict predictably increase. From Cook and colleagues, and, and she used three different measures of productivity, not RCR. They all, all of these positively correlated the group size, although they all show a pattern of diminishing returns. Doubling group size leads to less than a doubling in productivity. So we've heard the criticism that, well, but there are these special people who are, you know, just outstanding investigators and surely you don't want to compromise their efforts. So what we did was we looked at those investigators who have extraordinary RCR values. The average RCR for an NIH investigator is 1.5. These folks have greater than 40. So these are the absolute extraordinary individuals. And what's remarkable is when you plot their annually weighted RCR versus the grant support index, the overwhelming majority of them have less than three or less than equivalent R01s. Now, there are some that, that are you know, above that, but the majority are, are below that. So it's not a given that to have extraordinary output, you must have extraordinary support. We've also heard that if we were to change the current model, we would destroy the pipeline of early stage investigators, 
Because after all, all the new early stage investigators that are successful must be coming from these well-funded laboratories. So here are the data, and that's not correct either. So when you look at early stage investigators who are successful at obtaining an NIH RPG, turns out they're no more likely to come from a well-funded lab than from one that is modestly funded. There's, there's just no correlation to that. And we've sliced and diced this every way, clinical research, basic research, it, it just, it, there's just no correlation. If all of that isn't sufficient to convince you, there is this piece in the 21st Century Cures Act, which is this is amazing legislation that was passed in a bipartisan way by the Congress. And you'll recall it gives NIH over $4 billion over the next decade. But in addition to all of that wonderful stuff, it also is in the law that we shall establish within the office of the director of NIH the next generation of researchers initiative through which the director will coordinate all policies and programs that are focused on promoting and providing opportunities for new researchers and earlier research independence. It doesn't, it's not prescriptive as to what you should do, but it says you must do something. So, the question, how do we increase the number of early career funded scientists? How do we stabilize this career trajectory? And obviously, how do we maximize the impact of funding? So again, people in the community have, have opined, uh, Judith Kimball and colleagues from Madison, uh, identified the core problems, which you all live each and every day. Too many researchers vying for too few dollars, too many postdocs competing for too few faculty positions. Our recommendations are to redistribute funds to support both junior investigators and pioneering projects. That redistribution will be painful, especially for established senior investigators, but necessary. This is not NIH, this is people from the extramural community. And then FASA, um, you know, that represents so many thousands and thousands of investigators, in their sustaining discovery uh, report, write, research sponsors should monitor limiting the amount of funding awarded to any individual science, which would enable more people to be actively engaged in research and might enhance productivity overall, and our data say that it will. And then there's a request for information that we had back in the spring of 2015 when we asked about these issues. And the most common suggestion by either individuals or institutional respondents was capping the number of NIH grants or the amount of funds a PI can have. So many, many people in the extramural community have spoken out in favor of this type of approach. So, for, to begin, the existing approaches that we have need to continue. And as you all know, when you've seen one institute at NIH, you've seen one institute. They're all different, and we appreciate that. But here are some of the approaches that institutes may use, and some institutes will use all four, and some will only use one out of four. But, but this is the suite of options. Everybody adheres to the early stage investigator policy. That's a given. That's across the board. Some institutes can expand their R01 initiated research uh, pool. Others can use R56s as a bridge award for early stage investigators. Others are, are using or considering the use of R35 awards for mid-career emerging investigators. And all institutes and centers will track all stages of the career pathway. Um, but none of those current approaches directly address the issue of diminishing returns in the labs of highly funded investigators. And it turns out that most of the individuals who have the most support have that support from more than two or, two or more institutes, centers, or offices at NIH. And that's not surprising given the rise of interdisciplinary research and, and so forth. So therefore, we need a trans-NIH solution. We can't 
count on just the individual institutes and centers to resolve this themselves. So we're proposing to use the grant support index. It's a measure of a PI's grant support. And it's not simply a measure of dollars, because that doesn't work. Certain kinds of science are more expensive than other types of science. So the most obvious example, if you're doing a large clinical trial, it costs a lot of money. If you're doing genetics research with a model organism, it costs a lot less money. It's simply that, that, that that's the case. And so we can't just measure dollars. We are proposing to initially focus on RPGs, not infrastructure, not training, just RPGs. If you set arbitrarily an R01 or a U01 to seven points, that means that the point value for R03s and R21s would be less, and it means that the Mira Award, the R35, or transformative R01s would be more, and that in instances where there are sub-projects, for example, on P01s, we would treat each of those separately. So the, the, the proposed plan is still a work in progress. This is why I'm visiting with so many of the advisory councils of the different institutes and centers to get feedback. And we have iterated this now at least a dozen times as a result of the feedback that we've been receiving. So the, the proposal is to institute a trans-NIH policy that resets expectations for the support provided to any single investigator. We'd monitor the, G the research support using GSI. Eventually, we will calculate it for the applicant, although if we give people millions of dollars, we're pretty confident they can count up to 21 without our help. Um, we work with the applicant to limit the research project support to 21, which again is roughly equivalent to three R01s. Applications, and this is still very much open to discussion, but applications with investigators above a GSI of 21 would either submit a plan before or after, after being just in time, and we haven't completely resolved that yet. For any newer competing applications to mitigate an increase to the investigator's GSI. So what that means is, what that means is, is the application will be rolling. Nothing per happens precipitously. We, we only have this triggered with the submission of a new application or a, competing, a, co a competitive renewal. Yes, you had a question. Sorry to interrupt you. Are, are these Could you use the microphone? Because I'm thinking. Are these simultaneous grants or are these? in your career that are counted up? No, the at the moment in time. Time, not you. not in aggregate. No, because everybody. No. <laughs> We're here to help. <laughs> okay. No, it, it's at that moment in time. Okay. And so we would be resetting expectations. There will be an exceptions process, but it has to be initiated by the institute center or office director, and it it will be rigorous. This is not going to be business as usual. It will take into account these attributes, but the final decisions will be made centrally by the NIH Office of the Director. So what's the potential effect of this? Hypothetically, if the maximum GSI is 21 and only RPGs are included, about 3% of the investigators would be affected, and that would allow us to make about 900 new awards over the next few years. So, in effect, you're creating a whole new institute's worth of resources. We would put an analogous program in place for the intramural program. For those of you who know the intramural program, you know there are similarities to the extramural, but there are dissimilarities also. Nevertheless, we think we can come up with a fair process that would be analogous for the IRP. Here are some of the concerns that have been raised. Um, you know, what about complex clinical trial networks, team science, infrastructure training grants? We are proposing to focus on RPGs only, which mitigates all these concerns. Specifically related to team science, 
Initially, we had proposed that if an R01 was seven and you had two PIs, multi-PI uh, grant, we would drop it to six. People said, no, that's too severe. So we are now proposing to set that to five. So what that means is if we assume that the bandwidth of an investigator is about three R01 equivalents, and now the burden of overseeing the work is shared with another individual, it would make sense that they would be able to accommodate to greater than three. And so if the points were dropped to five, you could then go up to four shared R01. So that's the rationale behind it. We appreciate that we need to have special consideration where there's a need to attract highly talented investigators into new fields of science. Um, think about this in the context of an emergent public health emergency. Maybe, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why you have to grant you know, exemptions. And some people have said, well, you're going to compromise peer review. No, to the contrary. First level review will remain unchanged. These decisions will not be influencing peer review because we don't want to prevent any investigator from submitting what they think is the greatest idea they ever had in their life. Because it may be, and that, that would be wonderful. So the review will occur as it always does, and all of the adjudication occurs by the institute or center. Some institute directors will ask their counsel to weigh in, others may not. Ultimately, though, the decision for exception will be done centrally by the office of the director and not the institute or center director. So just to summarize, we remain committed to the robustness and stability of the next generation. We remain committed to optimizing the use of our resources. There are a variety of approaches that we have to use to bend the curve. The use of GSI alone will not do it. The use of the early stage investigator program will not do it. We need to do combinations. We'll monitor and track all the resources because if we take these resources and then just give them to other highly established investigators, then we're not really doing anything valuable. And we continue to shape these plans by stakeholder feedback. These are some of the many people who have been involved in this. Um, as you might imagine, it takes a, a, a great deal of thought and, and effort. <coughs> But I will now give you my email address. That is where you send all hate mail, not to the people in the previous slide. And so with that, I'll stop. And Pat, I assume you'll recognize your council members for any questions that they may have.